We've been having a, a couple of great external speakers uh, over the last couple of weeks. Now we get to have one of the great uh, internal speakers. So, so uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Leslie, for coming. And I think it's really good for us to every once in a while hear what the people right, that are sitting right next to us are doing, right? So I, I'm, really, I, uh, I'm really excited to see what Leslie has to say. Thanks for coming. All right, thanks. So, um, let's see. First, I want to say that uh, I've given some version of this talk in a bunch of venues that probably many of you have heard it in. And so um, I'm going to go along. But I suspect that if you've heard me do this once before, probably much of it didn't make any sense. And so I'm going to ask you to ask me questions. Uh, and it's possible that if you don't ask me questions, then I'll ask you questions. And that's probably bad the point. So anyway, I welcome all kinds of interruption, discussion, <coughs> dissent, complaint, whatever. Uh, that'll kind of make it all more fun. Um, and so also in front of this audience, I realized that you know my one decent joke is shot. But uh, here we are. Anyway, OK. So this is work that um, I've been doing with Tomas mostly, the estimation and some other parts of it, some other students in the group have worked on. So when we get there, we'll uh, acknowledge them. The problem that we're interested in is AI, right? So, uh, so this is robotics. The seminar is a robotics seminar. But the reason, at least, that I'm interested in robotics is as a way, as a kind of physical manifestation of the AI question. So how do you make an intelligent, like a really intelligent system, do stuff in the world? And our emblematic example is this kind of terrible, messy kitchen, not mine. Um, and the question is, well, if the robot, we ask the robot to come into this kitchen and to clean it or to make dinner or something, it might look around and really like not know what to do, right, guy? Right? How would you? How do you? How do you begin to like say answer the question of where the fork is? In this, in this so what makes it hard, right? So why why does this seem like a particularly challenging problem for a robot to uh, address? And there's kind of three main ways of, at least that, that we think about kind of breaking down the difficulty of the problem. So the first one is that the spaces are really big. So we're all used to saying, oh yeah, I play in high dimensional spaces, you know, and high dimensional is 12 or 16 or 52 or something. But what's the dimensionality of the space of that kitchen, right? It's not just the poses of the objects. We didn't even know, it is not even clear what an object is, right? Should we count the grapes? Right? Uh, positions and orientations, the state of the leftovers, everything. So there's all kinds of, the, 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 even the, the notion of a fixed dimensionality of that state space is our one. Um, there's also a really long time horizon. Right? So if you imagined, I mean, it's a crazy thing to think about. If you imagined to close the plan to clean this kitchen, how many primitive steps would it have? Right? So that's another one that's it's just kind of beyond thinking. And you can't really imagine making a plan that goes that long thing. Um, and the thing that actually I'm going to mostly focus on today uh, is uncertainty. Right? So there's fundamental uncertainty. And it's not just the kind of uncertainty that we're used to saying, oh, yes, there are Gaussian errors on my detections of the objects. There's deep uncertainty, like what's in this container? What will happen if I pull this out and so on? So that's not stuff that you can probably just resolve by looking more carefully or getting better sense. There's kind of deep and fundamental so um, I'm going to come back to you. Okay, so so we basically sort of have a, some strategies for addressing each of these problems. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the first two problems and about a kind of a sketch of our, our approaches to dealing with those, and then I'll spend a little more time on this last one. So in terms of dealing with really big spaces. Um, and I should say that in each of these sections, I don't mean to assert that we have an answer to the whole problem, but some steps in that direction. Right? So, so how do we deal with the big spaces? Well, one thing that, that uh, uh, you know, AI used to do all the time is use kind of logical and symbolic representations for things. And a lot of times we attach, we say, oh, well, the reason for using logical or symbolic representations is so that we can do kind of formal proof theoretic reasoning using those representations. We're going to use those representations, but without proof theoretic reasoning, the reason that we're interested in logical representations of the state of the world is because you can use a very simple and compact and kind of factorial language to describe very complicated conditions. 
right? So if I say there's snow in the courtyard, that's a name for an infinite set of states of the world, all the ones where there's snow in the courtyard. And if you think about it that way, it gives you a very powerful language for talking about just some aspects of what is a potentially very complicated state. So logic lets us talk about just some aspects and to put together our assertions about those aspects in a very kind of rich and combinatorial way. Another interesting thing to observe if you think about the problem of planning is that quite often the situation is that you, the, the current state, what you know about the world is very detailed, right? You know detailed geometric things about the arrangements of objects, but it might be that your goal is something very abstract. You want the house to be tidy or the robot to be charred. So there's this kind of interesting mismatch between sort of what you know about the world in complete detail and what you want, might want your goal to be. And there have been some previous attempts to do robotics inside logic, and they usually involved trying to make a symbolic representation of the geometric state of the world. That, uh, I, we think, is not very effective. So what we're going to do is use logical representations of goals and sub-goals in a way that I'll tell you about. Um, and work back to testing whether they're true or not in a kind of very detailed representation of the state of the world. So our strategy for planning is going to be something called regression. For somebody who does learning and planning at the same time, this is a particularly unfortunate name, but it comes from the planning people, and it just means planning backwards. So most, much of planning work starts in an initial state and tries to go forward. Uh, if you're lucky, you can go in both directions, but we're going to focus on going backward for uh, for the following reason. The idea is that we have a goal. And the goal, we'll say, has a compact representation of some sort of logical language. Right? The house is tidy, the people are fed, my owner wants to buy, you know, pay my rent for next year, whatever, kind of abstract goal like that. Uh, and then we're going to reason backwards, saying, okay, lame pointer. Um, we're going to reason backwards. We say the goal, okay, what's the goal? A logical goal stands for a set of states of the world. So I'll be happy if I can make the world be in any one of those states. And then I'm going to ask myself the question, if, if A1 were the last action I were to take, what would have to have been true before that so that if I take A1, I will be in a state that satisfies the goal? That's the fundamental notion of regression-based planning. That's the regression of the goal under action one. So I can search backwards, and what my state space in this search is actually space of sets of actual world states. And I search backwards until I find one that that, that in which my initial state lives, right? So my initial state is something totally detailed and concrete. And I say, if I get a goal set like this, that my initial state is inside, then I know that if I were to take action A2 and then action A1, I would be in a state where the goal so that's the search strategy that we're going to use. So we're going to search in the space of goals and sub-goals until we hit our initial state. Is this right? Okay. So um, I thought I would show you an example of that in a robotics context, just so you can kind of see how that goes. Um, and then we'll just introduce some ideas uh, that, that we'll build on later. So if you, you know, took a good old-fashioned AI class sometime or read Russell and Norvig or something like that, you've seen kind of planning using symbolic descriptions of the actions in the world. And so the question is, well, can we use that, some of those kind of symbolic planning ideas to do planning for our robot? So here's an example. Imagine that we want to write a kind of describe an operation for placing an object at some target location. So here's an operator description for doing regression-based planning. Uh, and we might say, okay, I would like this object, um, the result, right, so the result of this thing that we're trying to do is that the object is in a target region. So we would like to make a plan for putting this object in this target region. So we say, well, there needs to exist a path. Let's say, this is a cartoon, if that ever already there. Uh, there needs to be a path, say, from the object's initial <coughs> position to some position so that the object will be in the target region. And if this swept volume of that path, so the space the object has to move through, is clear. Right? So that's a, a precondition. If this swept volume is clear, then if I were to do this place operation, the result would be that the object is in the right? So that's a, the style of description and reasoning that we do. 
Um, I can show you an example now using a kind of a more real model. Um, so one thing that's important is that it, the, the first step in that operator description was something that we call a generator, right? It said there should be a path. Well, that's interesting. If we're in good old-fashioned AI planning land, we plan in domains that are completely discretizable, and when there's a variable that we need a value for, we just enumerate that. But if we're planning in the land of actual robots in real continuous space, then we can't enumerate all the paths, right? That's not a user strategy. So we build these things that we call generators, which are, in fact, in the computer science sense, a generator. That is to say, you can keep asking them for new answers. Uh, and we ask them to generate values of variables that range over continuous values uh, that satisfy some constraints. In particular, in this case, that they'll be uh, you know, get the object to the goal and so on. So um, we use a geometric planner to do this. And an interesting feature is that uh, these plans that we make geometrically that let us generate a particular path through space, they allow some collisions, right? They might, they would prefer not to collide with any objects. If we could not collide with any objects, that would be good. But if it has to collide with a movable object, that's okay. Because we're going to be able to fix that in a minute. So let me show how that goes. Okay, and also it's true that, that these things can be kind of a little bit approximate and they should be conservative and we don't necessarily, when we're finally executing it, we don't necessarily have to do particularly that path. So let me show you an example. So here's a robot, there's two <coughs> objects and they're set up so that the robot can't reach the object in the back because the one in the front is in the way. Okay, so this is, again, a toy example. It would like that back object, A, to be over here on the left side of the table. That's what the robot wants in mind. So it says, well, I could do a place operation. A place operation would be a good last operation if I want that object to be in that place. And the preconditions are that I'm holding the object and that there is a way of placing the object that's free. Right? So if there's a free path, if I'm holding the object and there's a free path to place it, then that would be good. And so it does some thinking in the generator, and this weird purple and yellow blob is the kind of the sweat volume that the robot thinks it would have to move through in order to place the object there. And in fact, that particular sweat volume is clear, so it says that part is good, but I'm not holding A right now, so I better figure out how to be holding A. So how can I hold A? Well, maybe I can do a pick operation. The precondition of the pick operation would be to pick up A. So I call the generator and I say, hey generator, can you generate a path for me for picking up A? And it says, yes, I can. And it generates this, again, thing that's hard to see, but it's this purple and, and yellow volume. But it has another object in it. It's not a free path right now. It's a path. And it's clearable in the sense that what it, it, although it has conflicts with the objects in the world, there are things that it can move. And so it says, all right, uh, I, I have a, you know, a candidate value for that path, um, but it's not clear, right? So uh, I can reduce this sub goal to one where these two paths are clear. If those two paths are clear, then I'll be good to go. But this one's not clear, so I have to do something about that. So it says, well, okay, I can apply this operation of removing an object from that path. That requires the object to be put in some location. I have to call a generator to guess a location where to put that object, and then I, uh, I, I, I pick it up. So I end up with a plan that says I should pick up B, that was the object in the way. Good, I'll finish this and then ask them. And then I'm going to place it in some parking place, and then I'll pick up A, and then I'm going to place it where I want it to go. Yeah? So when you address through the first step, so you're going to the other one path from holding the uh, thing or to, to the perfect location. Yeah. So how do you know where you're holding it? That's very good. Okay, good. So because we're doing this regression-based planning, how, what, what's this? Very astute question. I love it. Good. So the answer is that what we do is we have right now a single nominal home location, although we think we can generalize it reasonably well to having a network of home locations. And we say, uh, as long as I can reach my home location, then, it, then it's okay. Because if every operation I need to do can take me home, then I know I can chain them together. So yeah, that's a good point. So um, you might be about to tell this in a case of the way, but it sounds like you're making the claim that regression is the right way to plan in uh, symbolic representations. The problem I see with 
money backwards is twofold. One is some actions are really hard to invert, but your actions have to invert. You have to know where you started from. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our actions have to model using simulators, and simulators are hard to invert. And the other problem is that you can't do this leading horizon plan. In the sense that I can't plan to move some of the dishes. I have to start from the, the clear counter and work all my way back to you know the first thing that I take off. Okay. So what is regression buying? Okay, good. Super good questions. And I am not saying that regression is the right way to do symbolic based planning. In fact, symbolic planning people in the audience, I know there's at least a couple, will be jumping around in their seats and saying, no, 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 what we've learned in the last end <coughs> years is that forward is the way to go. We spent a lot, of, we've wrestled endlessly with this question. The answer is in a minute I'm going to start talking about hierarchy. And once we have abstract operations, I think they necessitate regression because we can't simulate them forward. We don't have simulators for abstract actions. So that's a reason for doing hierarchical planning. It also means that um, your problem about having to, to do everything in detail is also addressed to some degree by having a hierarchical abstraction. So let me go to hierarchy. Russ and then I'll go forward. Yep. It seems like your simple grounding is very subtle in the sense that you're, you're, you know, you're calling a path planner and it's pretty good to a Boolean value of yes, I, have, I thought a path or not, or you're calling a collision detector and it's telling you I've got a you know, collision or not. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope of you know having, it seems like you were clever and found a few places where you could do simple grounding, but is there a hope for having a small library of sort of ways that you can ground your symbol? I see. So the question is, what are the what are the, the lowest level vocabulary of kind of symbols, right? Branches from your continuous, you know. Right. So we have we make it, can make assertions about the pose of an object, whether it's in a region, whether a region is clear or not. Uh, so you do have, you have there's a, a small set of those. Yeah, and I'll make them probabilistic in just a minute. Okay. Okay, so that was that was just a kind of a little bit of a story about doing hierarchical and geometric planning put together and how the overall overall structure works. Um, so the next thing to talk about is hierarchical decomposition. So anybody, when faced with the problem of that, oh my planning horizon is too long, they'll say you should do it hierarchically. Okay, so we all believe that, but there aren't really that many <coughs> approaches where hierarchy really gives you a kind of qualitative win, which is a little bit. Uh, disturbing. Okay, so we're going to do hierarchical, a kind of hierarchical planning, but it's not the hierarchical planning that people typically do. Um, if you look in the classical planning literature, people use a hierarchical decomposition as a kind of heuristic for solving a whole detailed planning problem. So their goal remains to get out a completely detailed level plan. Our position is that for two reasons, we don't even want a completely detailed level of the plan. Actually, there's really only, only one super good reason for that. The super good reason is, in interaction with uncertainty, there's no particular reason for planning too far in advance. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna have to walk back to this data center, I'm gonna have to walk through the downstairs where there's all these people milling around. I could try to plan a path through there, but it's a stupid thing to do because I don't know who's gonna be in plan. Okay. So, uh, I'm gonna do hierarchical planning, but I'm gonna do it actually in the now, online, while executing. Um, there's a, just a quick sketch of our strategy for creating a hierarchical abstraction. If you write down planning operators that have preconditions, and so take a look at this one, right? Here's a, a, some one for placing an object, and it might be that my precondition is that I'm holding the object, and also that I'm in the same room as the place that I'm supposed to, to put it down. Yeah. This is just a cartoon. So here's my place precondition, right? It kind of my place operator, it requires a very specific set of things before it can execute. I also have a, a pick operator that achieves that I'm holding the object, but they don't quite plug together, right? Because pick doesn't guarantee that I'm in the right room. But if I temporarily just postpone thinking about one of the preconditions, if I postpone thinking about the in-room precondition, I get an abstract version of this operator which does plug into to place. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make abstract versions of my operators, plan at a high level of abstraction, and then later on think about how to take this abstract thing and make it concrete in terms of executable actions. And we're going to actually do planning and execution interleaved. So we'll take a top level goal, make a plan for it. We're going to make that plan by regression. And that's actually another important sort of thing that regression does for us. So if I make a regression plan for goal G, um, I get a plan, and a plan looks like this. It says, 
So here's my final goal. Here's my last operator. And this is an important thing, this G12. That's the pre-image of my final goal under this operator. It's a sub-goal. It's a set of states. And similarly, this G1 is a pre-image. It's also a set of states. And so what I'm going to do now, once I have this abstract plan, is I'm going to plan again using this set of states as my sub-goal. And that I'm going to get another plan. And then I'm going to plan again using this set of states as my sub-goal. And then maybe I'll get a plan that's got some primitive actions. And I'll execute them. I will optimistically go ahead and do those things in the world. And then come back and plan and execute as needed. So that's the strategy. So what happens when things go wrong? For example, you're, you, you're assuming that you're going to pick the object and then it's going to be fine, but you can drop it. Right, that's right. So, so in fact, what we do is replan okay. all the time. So this structure actually offers an opportunity to do some really nice uh, execution monitoring and management of replanning. So absolutely, the simplest thing you could do, because these plans are all very short, you could in fact just replan the whole thing every time after every action. But these sub-goals also tell you, you know what you were hoping to have happen as a result, so it's quite easy to see if, uh, did the action get you where you wanted to? If yes, you can keep going. If the action skipped you ahead, you can see that too. Like if something good happens, that's cool, you can immediately take advantage of it. If something bad happens and the preconditions for this aren't even true, then you would pop this off the stack and go back up here and make a new plan. So that's all kind of, it comes out very nicely from this, this hierarchy. How do you decide the granularity of the goals? That's a really good question. So the, what, what we do is write these operator descriptions that have a bunch of preconditions. And then a semi-clever human, that is to say me, decides uh, which ones to kind of postpone and, and how much to postpone them. So they, the preconditions are assigned a kind of a level of criticality. And that's what governs the actual abstraction that comes out. We really would like to be learning that, uh, along with a bunch of other things. Okay, so I want to talk about uncertainty. Um, and our strategy for dealing with uncertainty is, is based on replanning. Um, so, you know, the question is, okay, so the robot really, really, really doesn't have any access to the true state of the world, right? It gets observations, it's supposed to generate actions, and what goes in between? <coughs> well, you know, a kind of a standard answer would be a structure like this, and in fact, we're going to go with this much of the standard answer. Right? So we're going to kind of decompose the problem into a problem of doing state estimation, right? trying to take the stream of the history of observations we've ever gotten, the history of actions we've ever taken, and use those to estimate something about what's going on in the world. So ideally, that takes the form of a probability distribution over possible underlying states of the world. That's easy to say when your world is simple and discrete. It's a lot harder to say when it's big and complicated. So I'll say a little bit about the state estimation problem later on, not, not on time. If you do state estimation, then you have a belief, right? So this belief is, again, a distribution over possible states of the world. And your problem for action selection can be reduced to mapping what you think is going on into the world into actions that you should take. So we'll spend time, most of the time, thinking about the action selection. So this is a very, very standard decomposition. We'll do it. Um, OK, so then you know some people have heard about palm DPs. And if you know one thing about palm DPs, what you know is they're hard, often miserable, horrible, computationally intractable, or possibly undecidable problems. <laughs> OK, and so that leads lots of people to say, well, I don't want to do palm DPs because they're too hard. But the answer to that, I think, is too bad. Right? You live in a palm DP. You live in a world where you can't see the state, where you have to take actions. And so tough. You're in a palm DP. Now, you don't have to use standard palm DP solution methods, but you can't just say, I don't want to do palm DP, because I think if you're doing robotics, unless you have a miracle sensor, uh, you know, th that's where you are. OK, so we're not going to try to handle these using the standard strategy. Instead, we're going to take like a tiny bit of inspiration from, I think, what goes on in control, which is to say, well, you know what? I've got a model. I'm going to use my model and make a plan. Uh, or pick a first action or make a longer plan, and I'm going to take the first step. But my action, my model, I don't really necessarily believe it. And so after I take that first step, I'm going to look and see what happened, and then I'm possibly going to make a new plan. So, uh, and what 
that seems to do is let us off the hook from having a totally perfect model. Right? We don't have to have a perfect plan, we don't have to have a perfect model. We're going to have a pretty imperfect model and a very imperfect plan. Uh, but we're going to hope that the first actions that we take are kind of good enough to move us along in some useful direction. And then we're going to keep looking at the world and make plan. So that's the strategy. So. Okay. So our problem now, if you think about the planning problem, it's just, I wanted to kind of make clear what the plant is from the perspective of the planet. Because right? normally we think about what we're controlling is the environment or the state of the world. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plan in belief space. And what that means is that I'm going to try to drive the robot's beliefs into a state that I like. Never mind the world. I can't see the world. I can't, I'm not going to even think about controlling the world directly. I'm going to think about controlling my own belief. Now, I am required to do the state estimation according to Bayes' rule. Like, I'm not allowed to just hallucinate that I have a million dollars in my pocket. <laughs> so, because that would make things like easy and also difficult at the same time. So, this, this part you have to do your best job of, right? So, no <coughs> wishful thinking. But here, I'm just then I'm going to plan so I can plan to come to believe that I have a million dollars in my pocket. I can plan to do that. Right? But it's, it's about planning to come to believe something. So that's the idea. So I'm build a planner, make a plan, probably execute the first step. It's going to change the environment. I'm going to get observation, do a state estimation, get a new belief. That's how this thing is going to go. But from the planner's perspective, I'm planning in the space of possible beliefs about the way it works. Okay, so I have a very simple example. Um, this is uh, joint work with Russ and Tomas and Rob Platt, who is here as a postdoc. Um, and it's great as an illustration of this general strategy. And again, probably some of you have seen it, but it's kind of worth thinking about. I won't take forever on it, though. And then I'll switch to a bigger context. So imagine that... Uh, you're a robot, you're a point robot, the best kind of robot in the world is a point robot. And not only that, you're a point robot in the plane. Okay, so you're not a very good point robot, a point robot in the plane, but you're not sure where you are. Uh, and you have some kind of a, like a GPS or something that can tell you, give you estimates of your position, but it works pretty well when you're over in this part of the space. It doesn't work very well when you're over in this part. Okay, so this is the idea, you've got a GPS, it works well over here, not so well over here. And your goal is to be here and to believe that you're there, right? So your goal is to be standing in some location and to be quite sure that that's where you are. So someone who has, if there's anyone here who hasn't seen this before, someone who hasn't seen this before, tell me what would your strategy be? I can't embarrass you too much because maybe everybody's seen it. All right, if you've all seen it, then I'll go very fast. Uh, and, if you're, and if you're too lame to answer and you haven't seen it, then too bad for you. Okay. <laughs> so what you should do, right, what you should do is probably run over here and get localized and then run back to the goal if you start that answer. So uh, Ross and Rob had a very nice insight when we were thinking about this problem, which is that planning in belief space, doing control in belief space, it's just another kind of underactuated control problem. Okay? Uh, I can think of the state of this belief of this robot as having some mean and covariance. And I want to drive it to some particular state. I would like the mean to be this particular mean where I want the robot to be. I'd like the covariance to be zero. Zero is a little optimistic. I think just small would do. And so, uh, so that's cool. So it's just another underactuated robot. The problem, and it's underactuated because I don't have a motor for the variance, right? I don't have a way to say, oh, just let me become more certain. So I have to kind of do some other stuff, go some other places in order to drive the variance down. So the big question then is what are the dynamics, right? So what, and remember that the dynamics are in belief space. I have to think about how my beliefs change as a function of the actions that I take. So uh, let's see. So if we just say, oh, everything's Gaussian and beautiful, then I could use some kind of a common filter. That's how we think about the dynamics of a belief update, right? We say, this common filter will say that if we had an old mean and covariance about where we thought we were, and we got an observation, we took an action, it'll give us a new mean and a new covariance. So that seems like the right dynamics for uh, this simple belief state process. 
The problem is that we don't know the O. If we're going to be planning, if we're going to be looking ahead, the critical thing is we don't know what observations we're going to get. So the kind of canonical, correct POMDP type approach would be to find strategies that, that think about what to do for every possible observation and branch on the observations. Uh, but we're too lazy or time constrained or something to do that. So we're going to make a, a kind of slightly crazed approximation. Uh, and so the issue is that we would like, we need our dynamics, we would like our dynamics to have a form that's like this, right? That there's some deterministic function, the new state is a deterministic function of the old state and an action, maybe with some noise tag. <coughs> and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this thing and make it look like that by plugging in for the observation that we get some average or expected observation for the state that we're in. Okay, so if it sounds slightly ridiculous to you, that's good. It, it seems slightly ridiculous on the face of it. Right? So the idea is we're gonna plan a belief space. We're gonna still try to drive our belief to being something that we want it to be. But we're gonna make this slightly bizarre assumption that whenever we get an observation, it's the one that we thought was most likely for the state that we were in. So, although, so it may not seem like necessarily a good idea, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but at least you can see that it has the right form. So the formal aspects of our problem have been satisfied. Okay, so now we have a dynamics in belief space that's got the right form for planning, right? We can say if I'm in the state, I take this action, here's the state I'm gonna be in. And so then we can do trajectory optimization or whatever planning method you want to to try to get a trajectory through the belief space. So let me just then show you some examples of how this works and how it all plays out, right? So here's an initial plan. Imagine that we start here and this big old yellow circle, we just have a round variance. We're really uncertain about where we are. And I make a plan using those dynamics where there's, in this case, there's uncertainty in the observations, but there's no uncertainty in the robots transitions in this particular case. So it makes this plan. It says, okay, I'm here and I'm really uncertain. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over here, and as I go over here, I'm gonna get more and more sure about where I am, and then I'm just gonna run home and stand on the goal with low variance. So that's my initial plan. Okay, but it was made under this kind of assumption that we would just all the time verify what we were thinking. All right, so now let's see how this plays out, right? So in fact, as we begin to execute, try to execute that trajectory, it won't necessarily go the way we were hoping. So let's see what happens, right? So here we go. We, sit, we start out with the initial mean, estimated mean position of the robot up here. It's quite uncertain. But the actually, secretly, I will reveal to you that the robot is really here. Okay, robot thinks it's here. It's mean, it's here, but it's really here. And it wants to be here. So what it does is it starts trying to follow that trajectory. But as it does so, Right? As the robot moves and it gets observations, although it tried to move, it, it's, it's moving farther down than it's really trying to move in belief space, right? And the reason is that all the time it's trying to move along here, it's getting observations that are derived from where the robot really is. So it's saying, oh no, I'm really farther down than I thought I was. And every time it finds that it's gotten too far off of its trajectory, it makes a move. <coughs> So it keeps making a new plan, it keeps moving down, but also becoming better localized. So its estimate is becoming closer to where it thinks it was. Um, and eventually they meet, it comes back up, uh, and then it runs home. So the actual trajectory that the robot executes is this blue one, right? It really was down here and it started going down because we were controlling it to go down. And then after it got a better idea of where it really was and it was replanning, it came back up and it ran out. So this strategy forces the agent, the robot, to come to terms with the uncertainty in the world by forcing it to look. Because we ask it to have a low variance at the results, it's forced to take observations and then it's forced to take those observations into account and to replan in response to them. So that's, that's the kind of the intuition behind this general strategy. Okay, so now I'm gonna skip some stuff. 
and talk to you about how we put some things together. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about how we uh, combine the logical and the uncertain reasoning stuff together, and then hook it up with hierarchy and show you a real robot thing. Okay, so we can use logic. I said when I introduced logic as an idea, I said we could use logic as a name for big sets of states of the world, right? It's snowing in the courtyard. I can also use logic as a name for big sets of belief states. So that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that. We'll do a simple cartoon example just to get used to the idea. So imagine that I live in a world that has only three possible states. Then my space of possible beliefs is this simplex, right? It's a set of vectors of numbers, positive numbers that sum to one. And now I can talk about sets of beliefs. So for instance, I might want to say, I believe this object is at location L with probability at least one minus epsilon. Right? That's like saying, I'm pretty sure this object is in that location. So this set of belief states, if this peak of this, of this triangle corresponds to location L, then this little corner of that suplex is all the states where I believe that that state's true with probability greater than one minus epsilon. So I can now use a symbolic term for a set of probability distributions. And there's all kinds of interesting ones. I can say that I know the location of the object, for instance, without saying I know it's at a particular place. I can say, this, this is a way of, sort of like the discrete equivalent of saying I have low variance without saying what the mean is. Right? I'm pretty sure where the thing is, but I'm not telling you which place yet. <coughs> so this idea of using logical descriptions of sets of belief states is a, is a powerful. I have a lovely little discrete tutorial example. I'm just going to buzz over it so that we can get to the real robot stuff. So this is exciting. Was, okay. it, uh -huh. was that as opposed to having a problem with the notion of symbolic puzzles and solving certain discrete It is. So there is a totally other way to combine logical probability here, which is to have logical assertions that we attach probabilities to, right? Like snow in the courtyard. Is that you know 0.9 or something? Um, so that approach to probabilistic logic is is a, is another strategy, and it's useful for when you want to reason symbolically about kind of logic and probability put together. Uh, what we're doing here is just using logic. Still, it's a, still a zero-one logic on the outside. It's just an assertion about collections of belief states. So semantically, it's easier. The semantics of real probabilistic logic are complicated, and there's fights about two different ones and, and stuff like that. The semantics here are pretty easy. If you believe there's a space of probability distributions, I'm giving you names for sets. That's all. What do you mean? You must give something up. What do we get out of it? Oh, what do we give up? We give up. There are lots of sets that are difficult to describe. I mean, if I needed to describe a particular probability distribution at the completely granular level, then I would be back. There would be no advantage of doing this. So it's an advantage when I can plan abstractly uh, and, and get plans that satisfy my goal. So, and that regression is a way that helps us kind of plan abstractly. So they, they go together in terms of helping each other out. Uh, OK, so actual robot. Oh, I'm going to keep going and then answer questions, because I've got myself in a little, little bit of a bind, and I would like to show you the end. So let me just tell you something about how we make this now apply. We've done cartoon robots of various kinds. How do we make it apply to an actual robot? So there's a whole big, all sorts of trouble in representation and estimation. Uh, right, so how do we represent a distribution on the positions of the objects? That's not totally easy, but we're doing something. We can represent uh, some version of the space that we've seen so far and where we think things are occupied and not occupied. Um, and Lawson's been doing work on representing uh, what kinds of objects tend to be found near which other kinds of objects. Well, different kinds of representations that we can have of the distribution over the state of the world around us. So this is all in the estimation part. I'm not going to say too much about it, except that it's, it's not necessarily easy. Um, so we also have uncertainty about geometry, which we deal with by essentially making shadows of the objects. Right? So when we plan, 
Remember, we're playing in <coughs> belief space. When we play in belief space, we have to think about the distribution of where an object might be. And uh, we often say, well, if I need a plan that's going to be, except that's going to be, a, a, say, a, a path that's free with probability greater than 0.95. I can achieve that by making sort of grown, probabilistically grown versions of the obstacles and then plan in the usual sort of motion planning way with respect to the grown obstacles. Okay, so our symbolic representation for this version of the planner, now there's a much better version of the planner, but for this version of the planner, it looks like this. So these are the symbols we use. This is kind of the basis set of symbolic relationships in belief space, right? So this says, for instance, I believe the value of the relative pose of object one and object two uh, to a, a, an epsilon and delta. Let me not get into the details of the epsilon and delta. But this means I kind of know where O1 is with respect to O2. This is, I kind of know where O is. I believe with high probability this region is clear except for the following obstacles. I believe that this object is in this region with high probability. I believe that this object is not overlapping that region. And so this set of symbolic descriptions of probability distributions is the vocabulary that we use for planning. Okay, so now I'm going to illustrate with an example. Um, it's a kind of a silly example, but the idea is, let's see, there's a soup can here and a blue box back here. This blue box in the stuff you see will be called soda because it's a baking soda box, but it's taped up because it was leaking. So we have two objects, soup and soda. And we have the room out constraint so that it can't go around the back of the table and so that it can't reach the soda box from the bottom. Its goal is to pick up the soda box and put it over here on this side of the table. So it starts by making a hierarchical plan. It does not, it knows those objects exist, but it doesn't know where they are particularly. It has a distribution of where they are. And so it starts and it says, well, what I need to do is to, uh, is to first, I'm going to place the soda box, and then I'm going to look to be sure it's where I put it. That's its highest level plan. And it does some more planning and refining hierarchically, and it says, well, I need to go look at that thing before I really plan how to pick it up. And at first, I have to move so that I can look at it. So that's its first thing. I'm going to move so I can look at the soda box so that I can make a plan to pick it up. And so uh, it thinks about, it, when it thinks about looking, it reasons about the view cone it's going to have and if it can stand in a place where it believes that that view kind of will be free so that it can see the object. And then uh, it moves over there and it takes a look and when it takes a look, it dispels its uncertainty. That was good. And it also reveals the existence of the nefarious soup can that's in there. Okay, so then it's gonna have to re, so, oh yes, and the robot can do that. Yeah. Okay, so then it has to do, oh, it says, oh no, there's this thing in the way. It does a lot of complicated planning. And basically it says, I have to move over, so I have to make that sweat volume clear. That sweat volume for picking up the soda box has to be clear, but the soup can is in the way. So how am I gonna make that sweat volume clear? Well, I'm gonna have to pick the object up and put it somewhere. So um, it, now it's gonna roll up, it's getting ready to pick up the soup can. Uh, so it comes over here, it's getting ready to pick up the soup can to take it out of the way. It says, oh, but I just moved, and when I move, I incur odometry uncertainty, right, because the encoders on the base are not so good. So you can see the robot got a little fuzzier in this picture because it moved. So it says, I'm, I don't have enough, I don't believe my relative pose with respect to that supercon well enough to be ready to go and pick it up, so I'm going to do a look operation first. To do a look operation, I have to have an unoccluded view of the thing, and right now it's occluded because of my hands in the way. So it says, okay, I better move my hand out of the way. I mean, it plans, generally, to say I need that region to be unoccluded. I can do that by moving my hand out. Moves its hand out, takes a look. Uh, I can see the robot doing that. Uh, then it's going to, from here, it kind of goes in the way you'd expect. Right? It picks up the can, comes over here. You can see it got a bunch of odometry uncertainty again because it moved. So it's going to look at the table to establish where it is with respect to the table before it's willing to put the can down, then puts the can down. The can has a lot of uncertainty, but it doesn't care. Its goal is only to get the can out of the way. So it doesn't bother looking at the can again to, to narrow down its certainty. And then it's going to go back and pick up the box and put it in. 
So what's good about this is that it's using really quite general purpose forward or, uh, reasoning about the effects of its actions in the world. Lots of times I give this talk and people say, oh, well, how hard was it to encode those behaviors? And I say, ah, I didn't encode any behaviors. Yet. This is all kind of reasoning from uh, the effects of actions in the world in order to make its belief state be what it wants to be. Okay, so good. So yay, it managed to provide where it was supposed to be. Okay, so I'm gonna now show you a, a video of a project that we did with uh, Martin Levine and Mike Stillman, and it's basically a NAMO problem. That means navigating among movable obstacles. And what's cool is that this is almost the same code. Right? Because we're just reasoning about space and volumes and getting things out of the way, we asked the robot to drive out the door of the lab. There are chairs in its way. It didn't know that there were chairs in the way, but it said, I need to go through this volume to get out of the lab. And in order to do that, I need this sweat volume that I'm going to move through to be clear. And then it looked and it saw the chairs in the way and it said, uh-oh, it put the chairs in its model. And now it has to say, okay, I have to figure out something to do with these chairs. And now it's thinking about calling generators to decide where can I put the chair? How can I come up and approach it? Um, at this moment, it's about to come and kind of pick up the chair. Uh, but then and it's realizing again that it's uncertain with respect to where the chair is. And again, does this thing of moving its arm out of the way, takes a better look, sees where the chair is, picks it up, picks it up. So it will eventually move these two chairs out of its way and exit the lab successfully. I think, so with that, I will say thank you, and then you can ask me questions while this plays. So thanks. Seems picking the epsilon is like a pretty critical point of this thing, and it seems epsilon is like not only context sensitive because depending on how precision control your controller is, it also seems like in certain situations your sensors are like not ever going to be good enough to get to that epsilon area, in which case you just fail, right? Like you'll never get to that one of those police spaces. Right. So the question is good. So, so the question is how do you pick the epsilons and the variances? And right. So it is absolutely true that if your sensors are really bad or your actuation is just highly unreliable, then you can never succeed. Sure. That's just how that, I mean, that's, that's that. And you won't get a plan that tells you you can't. Um, it actually, it does reasoning about what the epsilons need to be. So it does regret, in the regression reasoning, it says, for instance, if I need to believe at the end 0.9 that I'm somewhere and I'm taking an operation to, to move, then it'll say I needed to be more sure about where I was before that so that I can be 0.9 when I'm done. And it also reasoned about how the looks change the epsilons and the variances too. So that's part of the regression reasoning about this thing. Yeah. Maybe you explain this, but so sorry, but how, how does it decide if the chair is removable but the wall is not or that it's not a door? Good, that is built in. So it knows, a, a sh in this case, a very small set of objects that it can recognize visually, and it knows that they're movable. And in this example, we didn't do any additional slam type stuff. So it knew about the walls. It knew about the permanent obstacles. It didn't know about the movable ones. Yeah. Yep. So even if you're just running exactly the system you show you, what are the, you know, what are the pain points? What are the pieces that fail the most and the uh, most frustrating? Yeah, good. What's the most frustrating? Perception? Uh, I mean, so, um, I mean, we're doing, you know, matching some models against point clouds and so on, but so, so, so perception is just, as always, a pain. Um, there are things in the estimation that are, that are pretty tricky. I mean, the first thing that bit us, which we were not anticipating, but it's obvious in retrospect, is let's say you're estimating the position of the soup can from detections and the position of the table from detections. And you say, what's my map estimate of the position of the soup can and the table? Well, the can is embedded in the table or else it's floating. Right? So there are these extra constraints. So there's questions about how do you really represent your belief? How can you combine information you get from um, uh, detect the, the detection that space is free, which you get from the connect? How does that combine well with the information that are stored in the common filter? So that's another can of worms. Um, there's, you know, figuring out in motion planning how, I mean, how to really effectively combine that with the probabilist, with the, with the symbolic reasoning. So 
our thinking about that has evolved for a fair amount. We're trying a slightly different strategy. But there's still questions about like how hard do you, as ever, how hard do you try to solve a motion planning problem before you give up and decide it's not doable? Um, stuff about searching over grasps and I mean all that stuff is not gone away, right? So all the whole stack of normal problems we have are there. Um, but we do get some kind of nice robustness some of the time, and we're hoping to get more of it more of the time. Yeah, so when we plan backwards, right? So let's say I'm, I'm, I'm doing regression-based planning, and I say, I need this path to be free, right, before I can do the last place. And so I say, okay, I need that path to be free, uh, and that remains as a constraint when I'm working backwards. So it knows, so let's say that currently that path has object A in it. So, I, so currently I say, I say okay, I need that path to be free. Then I decide to remove A. But now I have a new condition, which is that I need that path to be free except for A. And I bring that back. So when I'm suggesting, when I'm generating locations to put a different object, they can't violate the condition that that path be free except for A. Is that for all time or for that particular? For that hierarchical plan. So the hierarchy definitely introduces stupidity. So for instance, it's moving its hand out of the way, right? So it said, oh, if I need to look at something, I can do that. It didn't, it, it didn't worry about the details of how it was going to look at something at the, at the same level of planning. So it goes up, it's getting ready to pick the thing up, and then it says, OK, I really need to know where it is, and then it moves its hand out of the way. If we had been less hierarchical about that, it might be that we could have looked at it without kind of moving the hand out. The you always lose something when you hierarchicalize. And you, what you lose is the opportunity to weave things together better. Um, if we make a bad hierarchicalization decision, later on we'll retreat the problem more concretely so we think that we, we can still solve it in the end. But it may take extra steps. There's no question. Extra physical steps in the world. So, so you talked about the hierarchy part, but the now part of it uh, means that uh, you can't provide guarantees that your plan will Right. That's right. If we're in a domain where it is possible to paint ourselves into a corner by some ill-considered actions at the beginning, we cannot prove that we can reach the goal. We can prove that we can reach the goal if the, our actions are ultimately reversible. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're right. If you're in a, if this is a nuclear reactor, this is not the right way to do the planning. Uh, <laughs> if it's moving stuff around in my kitchen, it's mostly okay. Yeah. How much coverage do you think you get with your uh, least space symbolic vocabulary? For example, it seems really good for rigid body groups, but like, oh. I don't think it can represent like water and stuff. Of course not. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, I don't pretend that that was the right vocabulary for solving oh. any more problems than the ones. I mean, it's, I think it's pretty good for picking place. Yeah. Um, no, I think as you, as you address more problems, you still have, you still have the difficult design problem of creating an appropriate abstraction. Right. I don't know how to do that. Is there a coming role for more expressive logic at the top, or are we pretty much happy with that? I mean, we've talked a bit about temporal logic as a way to reduce it on those schools, but uh, I mean, do you, you ever feel like you can't code your, your current logic specification with that? Um, <laughs> no, 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 well, okay. So the, you would use temporal logic specifications if you care about the properties of the trajectory and not simply the final goal. And um, I could imagine eventually caring about that, so, so that's something I could imagine wanting. I'm not so sure, though, about the, I mean, you can always say, for instance, I have to keep the, imagine that, that you might say, oh, I have to keep the glass upright while I'm moving, and so that's, I need this constraint on the motion. And then I can totally just articulate that as I need the water to be in the glass at the end, and let the causal reasoning figure out that that I need to keep it upright. So, you know, the balance of how much work the human does to specify some aspects of the goal versus letting the system determine it, I think as the problems get more complicated, I, you know, that'll be a thing we have to think about. I think the thing that scares me the most 
actually is in representation and estimation. Never mind the logical part of it, but the actual, like, how do we represent what we know about the state of a very complicated environment? Um, I, you know, that, I think we, AI people used to think about knowledge representation, but now approximately nobody does. Uh, and we're really good with common filters and, and particle filters, uh, and that's kind of it. And I, Is it possible to use this planning framework for dynamic environments? For example, the objects are moving and you want to pick and place the object, but it's not clear to me how you would do the hierarchical plan if you don't know like, where they are going. Like, so that's a good question. So, in a, in a, so what about a dynamic environment? So what if objects can move? So there's nothing, uh, I mean, there's nothing here that says that you couldn't do that, but the representation of the operators would have to change because you really need some background processes. So we don't right now have a declarative description of how the world is changing independent of how the robot is changing it. So you would need that. Um, I mean, I think the hierarchical stuff, again, you would have to be able to reason at some abstract level, just as we reason abstractly about uh, what the robot can do in kind of bigger chunks of time, you'd also have to be able to reason abstractly about those processes in the world, which you could probably do, right? Like when you're driving your car and you look over your shoulder and you see a car behind you and then you don't look for a while, you can kind of, maybe without complete estimation, you can have an idea of like it's been, you know, has it been so long that we need to look again or something. But that's another, I think, an interesting and difficult representation problem. So I don't think it's inconsistent with this, this approach, but you need a lot more work to do a good job of it. You could do space time. You could do space time. For, for low level stuff, you could do space time. You could plan in space time. Although, how that interacts with the hierarchical in the now business is tricky. Uh, and if it's the timings are really tight, you have to worry about how long it's taking you to do the planning and all that. And we are not thinking about that. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. Later.